Let us give thanks. Father, what joy. What a blessing it is to be together in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus died for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord, was humble all the way to the cross, according to the Holy Scriptures. What amazing love. We just praise his holy name. Let us say amen. I remember uh, Joe not too long ago was talking to us about the word awesome and uh, just uh, how he looked that up and uh, how he applies it to God. And I, every time I think about God, those thoughts come back. It reminds me of what he shared with us. And on the screen, I just used a slide with the word God on it and uh, so many descriptions of God throughout Scripture. If you're reading in a chronological Bible this past week, you were into the Ten Commandments, into the tabernacle, into who was supposed to do what and how they were supposed to do that. I was sitting there the other night and Lorna was looking through her, reading through her Bible and, and she says, I don't know if I can get through this or not. <laughs> or something along that line. And I just, you know, kind of, because I, I understood what she was saying. You, you read through the sections uh, where you're reading right now. And it's just every, every detail, everything. He says to the Israelites, you know, do this. And he puts the specifics on them. And you see events happen that, that's, you know, for instance, a couple of priests don't do it the way they were supposed to. And God immediately responds to them. It, 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 just things happen in this section. Let me remind you some things here. Israelites, these Hebrew people, have been in captivity for over 400 years. They were in a society that did not have a Sabbath day. You worked seven days a week. They were slaves. They had to do what they were told to do. It was a time in which they had no time to worship. And if they thought about God... They would have thought about God more, most likely, late at night after they had been exhausted from this, what all was happening to them in the slavery that they were in. I, I know when we talk about Moses, and you've read through all this, Moses, God says to Moses, go deliver my people, and Moses does it, and immediately you've got, you got images that come up. Maybe it's the old classic uh, movie of the Ten Commandments you know, that you remember or maybe you remember more of the later times you know and some of the more newer movies that, that give you such an emphasis on that deliverance but when Moses first goes to Pharaoh and talks to Pharaoh it's interesting and uh, that's in Exodus 5 verses 1 through 5 uh, in your reading and uh, I'm not going to put every text that I, what I've done is I put it all together for you. And if you have not read this section of scripture, you're going to be lost. So it's one of those times where if you haven't been reading what we've been praying in the messenger or haven't been using chronological Bible, you're going to be a little bit lost in what's going on. But in Exodus 5, when Moses comes before, Mo, before Pharaoh, and that's the first five verses, he says to Pharaoh, I want my people to go off three days journey to worship and to sacrifice. Now I know you, you, from all the stories you read, you immediately you think about let my people go. And that hits home. And you understand that. But I think that passage is a key passage to understanding the Hebrew people and where they are in their development. They don't know God. Yes, they know God. They, they know, yes, there's, there's a God. But they've been in Egypt for 400 plus years. Generations have grown up. And you had all the great idols that were built to all the different gods. They had seen all this worship, not to one God, but to many gods. And so Moses says to Pharaoh, I want to take my people three days journey 
so that they can sacrifice and worship Pharaoh said it ain't going to happen there's a real reason why it means replacing Pharaoh on the throne that he's placed himself on in the hearts of these people to know God is to know freedom to serve God is to understand the great freedom that we have it's to understand far more than we can even begin to talk about at times because at times you're just overwhelmed you know we'll talk as Joe did you know this is the day that the Lord has made and all of a sudden you get up in the morning and you realize God has given me this day no person no government no country has given me this day just my God now they didn't know this so God as, as he leads them out of the slavery that they're in they get a lot of struggles going on they get depressed they get down they get struggle with so many things you know they get out and, and in the traveling that they're going to do there will be moments in which they shout out to God God we're hungry there's not enough food we'd rather be back in Egypt where our masters gave us all the fine foods to eat times they want to go back into that slavery of course each time God does something the manna comes or the quail comes or the water comes pouring out. God each time responds. Because he wants them to understand. You were once. Yielding to that. Which did not give you. What you have. But you think. You think that they gave it to you. But I'm God. And I'm greater than anything else that you face. See they have to reach that point. So as you read through this section, and you pretty much have read through all of Exodus this past week, you should have read through all that. One of the things that should grab you is that we serve a God who is very concerned about every detail in our lives. And you say, okay, give me a passage on that. Read the text, folks. God is involved to the point that he says to the Israelites look you're going to do this and this is what I this is how I want it done this isn't about God saying I am your master it's about God saying if you're going to come to know me let me expand your thinking when you were in Egypt you had to be up picking up straw for the bricks that you made you had to go look for food when it was time to eat someone told you exactly when to eat and you had you didn't sit down and say thank you God for the food you looked at your slave master and said thank you for letting me eat I've got to change all that I've got to change your thinking I've got to give you something better to think about and you begin to look at the tabernacle. And, and something as simple, and, and you'll read more about that this week. God, for instance, will say, look, when I, want, when I need to call you to attention, I want you to sound these horns. What horns? The horns that you make out of the most precious of metal. They will shine in the sunlight. You will not only hear them, but you will see the sparkling from the sunlight. You will know something beautiful is being done because I will not give you something that's old and beat up and muddy and, muddy and dirty. I will give you something beautiful. So as you read through, every detail is about God doing something beautiful. To do what? To have them to know who he is. He is a God that's involved in, the, in their lives, and he does not do second-rate things. He is not this second-rate thing that you create with your hands, and you set it up, and you say, there's my God. No, he's the God that created us from the very dust of the ground. 
and made us into something wonderful. And now he has to take them back to an understanding of who he is. And so first thing it catches you is, is God is involved in everything taking place. Second thing that you pick up is how God listens. If they're hungry, he responds. If they're thirsty, he responds. And, of course, one of the first things that we always talk about in this section of Scripture is that Moses has been on the mountain for 40 days getting uh, the, the written law in the, in the stone. And, and they began to worship the golden calf. Well, the golden calf was a throwback to Egypt. Wherever they went in Egypt, there were golden calves to worship. There were those types of image. And so they, you find themselves, because Moses has been gone for 40 days, see, they're accustomed to what? They're accustomed to 24-7 someone telling them what to do. They were in a very prison of a culture that dominated everything about them. And for Moses to be gone for 40 days was like an eternity to them. And so they began to worship this idol. And, you know, they don't see God. God's on the mount with Moses. Moses is there doing what God is telling him. God is explaining things to him. God's going over details with him. They can't see God. Remember the part of your story this past week where God says, Moses, you're so special to me. I want you to see me. But you can't really see my face. Because I am beyond anything that you can imagine. And I don't want you to be hurt by the very appearance. So he passes by Moses while he hides his eyes. And when Moses comes down off the mountain, Moses is just because he's been in the very presence of God. There is an appearance about Moses, a glow about Moses. You know about glows, don't you? It's, it's, it's when you look at that person who first falls in love and you know something's going on with them. Or you look at that new mother and she has that special appearance about her. Or you look at someone who just experienced something. For Moses, in the very presence of God, he shines. So he has to wear a veil. But in the midst of all this, God has not ceased to listen to his people. Is he busy? Yes. Is he concentrating on something? Yes. Is he focused on something? Yes. But he still listens. And down off the mountain, there's a noise going on. And God says, Moses, tells to Moses, you've got to get out. We've got to straighten something out. But God doesn't turn a deaf ear in the midst of great struggles. He says to Moses, okay, it, you know, and I'm, I'm assuming some things here, but we're not going to go there right now. But he says to Moses, if they're going to act that way, I'm, they're not, I'm not going to make a great nation out of them. But I will make a great nation out of you, Moses. Which will do what? Which will honor the promise of the covenant that we talked about last week. The covenant that was given to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. This covenant that spoke of, of what was going to happen. He says to Moses, I'm going to narrow the covenant down. And I'll make it only to you and to your family, Moses. Because you're part of Abraham's family. Moses turns to God and says, please don't do that. God listens to Moses. It's one of the great texts of all time. Does God ever hear you? Yes. And it's not about, a, it's not about you being perfect. Because Moses has already shown himself he's not perfect. It's not about everything that you understand. See, it's about who God is. I belong 
was the phrase I used at the communion. I belong to the Lord. It's about he claiming me. It's about my God reaching out to take me. And I love that thought. Is God listening? Yes. How many times have I, have I knelt in prayer with someone and said, I don't know that God's hearing me. Why is this happening to me? Does not God listen to what's going on? Yes, he does. And he responds. In this case, the Israelites, the Hebrew nation, never understood that at that moment in time, if Moses said, yes, God, I will be the person you want me to be, every Israelite would have died on the spot except for Moses' family. They'll never know that because one man prayed to God. He said, please don't make that happen. third thing that you pick up in the text if you and again i know it's hard you're reading through this and you got all those weird names of all these people and you got all this weird stuff going on you know you're going to do this and you're going to do that and and you, you kind of scratch your head and say why why god makes changes in the lives of people and one of the great things you see in exodus is the great changes that God is making in the Hebrews. Why? So that they will understand who he is. It's hard for us theologically sometimes to, to understand and to grasp God. But our world, this creation we live in, is constantly changing. And those changes don't happen just because we think we're doing something. God is making changes so that we will understand he is God. I still love getting up in the morning and watching the sun come up. It's one of the neatest parts of the whole day to me is the sunrise. Because all of a sudden it hits me. I didn't do a thing. For the sunrise I have no power to make the sunrise and I don't deserve that sunrise I've done nothing to deserve it but my God wants me to know he's still here and still in control so when you read through and maybe you have to go back and reread all last week's readings Read it through the eyes of understanding. God is saying, I am involved. Two, I am listening. And three, I am making changes. Okay, that's good. That's Old Testament, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm living, you know, 3,000 years after all this took place, 4,000 years after all this took place. World's changed. Everything's changed. What difference does that make? Take it to a passage. Philippians 4.11. It's also on the front of the messenger. Every week there's a passage on the front of the messenger that generally speaking fits the occasion, fits what I'm doing in the sermon. One key verse. Not to complicate, because I know that you just read through Exodus and it's overwhelming to read that much info. But Paul summed it up this way. I've learned to be satisfied with what I have and with whatever happens. You see, that's where God is taking the Israelites. You need to learn, he says to the Israelites, I am providing for you. You need to understand that it's, it's nice to just to be satisfied that there's a sunrise. It's to be nice to understand I have some food to eat. And it may not be what I want all the time, but that's not the point. The point is, learning what? To be satisfied. Because who is supplying? God is. And who's in charge of whatever is happening? Oh, we, we, we need to get off the arrogance and the pride and the boastfulness that we have as people 
and as so many places in the world had and as countries have and as, as people who are in power and authority think they have. There's that, that all this stuff we see going, you know what? There's nothing you're going to do that's going to stop God from doing what needs to happen. God's in control. Sometimes we fear that God's in control. The Israelites were scared to death when they left Egypt. You see it all the way through Exodus. They're scared. They don't know what to do. They don't even know what decision. For them to make decisions, they didn't. The Egyptians had made all the decisions for them. God takes time to mold and to shape so that they'll learn to make decisions but not just any decisions decisions that say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be my God blessed be the one who gave me life you see Paul began to understand that and when he writes this key passage to, to the Christians of the first century he's telling them who's in charge? God is why are you so angry? Why are you so upset? Why are you so whatever you are at the moment? Paul says, my God's in charge. So I learned to be satisfied. Because my God, he's involved in my life. My God listens to me. And my God is there for me. My God is always taking care of me. My God is a God. Yes, there's going to be changes in my life. But God's at work to do what? In the midst of those changes to remind us. He's God. And I have nothing to fear but fear itself. For my God removes all fear. My God says, come. I'm with you. And I will never desert you. I think that's a great message for us. That's not a message you're going to hear when you leave this place today. I know. You're going to hear a lot of messages. But you've got to keep coming back. God is involved. God listens. God makes changes. Not for change sake, but for changes that bring us closer to him. Prayer theme. Henry, you have that? Our prayer theme this week is whatever may come. God, please teach me how to be content in the midst of the chaos. Do not let me forget that you are the one who is in control. That whatever comes, whatever comes, you are still God. God, please show me how to be content regardless of whether my cupboards are bare or overflowing. Remind me that you are the God of abundance who meets all the needs of your children. God, please teach me how to be content with what this physical body can do and what it can't do. Do not let me forget that you are the eternal God, not a finite God of flesh, but spirit everlasting. God, please show me how to be content as I cry out in my sorrow and my pain. Remind me that you are the great comforter in whose presence my soul will be calmed and I will find peace. God, please, teach me how to be content in the confusion when I do not know what is coming. Do not let me forget that you are the author of creation who wrote my stories never ending. God, please, show me how to be content when my mistakes and my failures have buried me in shame and guilt. Remind me that you are the God of grace and the God of compassion and whose outstretched arms even I, the very worst of sinners, will find forgiveness and rebirth. God, please, teach me how to be content whatever may come, when man is at peace and when man is bent on destruction and war, when man seeks goodness and when man trades goodness in for wealth and power. Do not let me forget whom I serve, that my God is not man, but the almighty I am, who is ever faithful and ever true and will never abandon his people. Amen. And to that.